Thank you to all the panelists for joining us today and providing us uh, significant um, inputs into their research. Um, Moshul, uh, we have some time limitations, uh, but I believe our panelists are available for an open discussion. Good afternoon, Stephen. Karina, good afternoon. And Christine? Hello. Excellent. So just to enable the discussion and to begin the discussion, um, as you know, the railroad industry is highly regulated, uh, which means that that sets up a, a significant number of challenges for our research in, in your specific arenas and also the application of technology and implementation of innovative uh, solutions when we are designing for real problems, right? Um, this question goes to you, Stephen, Karina, and Chris, uh, for starters. Um, at times when we're working with different uh, problems and driving solution design, um, railroad experts tend to work within silos. Um, how important is it within your research to incorporate other railroad experts and disciplines in your work to address requirements of asset system operations in a holistic way, if you will, um, and incorporate that into your design research solutions. And what are those challenges and how did you overcome those challenges? Um, and we'll open it up for you to um, provide some input. Well, for, for me, it's, 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 um, it is important to have railroad pe people with railroad experience serving as someone to look over your shoulder on this. We are very, we are very, uh, how do you put it? We are, we are kind of in a silo in the railroad industry and there's not enough, there's not a lot of people. And so we always need someone who can do a reality check. And that's, that's always the most important thing is that are, are the numbers we, we, we are generating, are they appropriate? Do they seem to be correct? You know, do they make sense? Uh, these are the sort of issues you have. For me, it was just a matter of experience, just uh, with the amount of time I spent working around railroads, it was just a matter, a matter of uh, acquiring the knowledge through the years. I can add on to that from our perspective. Um, a lot of what we do with our, as a follow on to our research is work with the rail industry to update both the federal regulations and the industry safety standards. And, and by that, we usually mean um, APTA, American Public Transportation Association standards. Um, we work within the construction structural subgroup where we have standards for uh, fuel tanks, passenger seats, workstation tables, um, and we meet generally quarterly. And whenever we give them updates on the evolution of the standards as we are um, working to uh, update revisions and we, we get a lot of input in these meetings, we propose our proposed changes to a standard, for instance, the table standard. And in the meetings, we have input from table manufacturers, rail operators, um, rail authorities who buy equipment with tables. And so we get a, a wide variety of input from people that use these tables, have to build these tables. Um, and so we, we don't do this in a vacuum at all. Um, so I think that we, kind of the nature of our rulemaking and standard making activities and working groups, we get a lot of input from, from all the players involved. Excellent. Karina, any additional comments? Sure, I'll, I'll just add that, um, that this is what Chris is, was talking about. It is, it's the process that FRA has, um, has set up to make their regulations, which is unique, that it involves um, being, it, it involves working groups that involve all the stakeholders. Um, and, and then even once bef before we get to the process of, of trying to make a reg regulation or trying to implement um, some of the research into, into standards through APTA, um, we, we're also very conscious of trying to present the research at every step of it. So before we're going to run a test, we'll have a paper that we put out in an ASME conference, for example, or that we present to the APTA um, working group. And we, and we, we make sure that we, we have some feedback from what we're doing before it's done. 
Um, and then we also make sure that we present at a, at a variety of forums. We present internationally as well. So, we, so we're working with the international communities abroad as so many of them are providing the equipment that, that exists here in the US now. And, um, and then we also work, you know, we, we show up at TRB, the Transportation Research Board uh, annual meetings and, and make sure that we are talking to all parties involved and getting feedback at all times. And thank you for that. Uh, the work that you do is, is instrumental in developing safety uh, policies and also um, implementing um, innovation in, in how we address safety problems and safety issues in the rail industry. Mario, this, this question is next for you. Um, obviously, in our industry and generally, we have the privilege to be working in an era rich in technology advancements. Um, the QTEC laser Doppler remote technology seems quite promising in the application of methods for evaluation of different uh, stressors in rail assets and uh, with the potential for more multiple applications um, that range from forensics analysis, engineering design, and even operations and maintenance of rail systems. So after listening to your co-panelists cool today, um, how do you see the laser Doppler uh, remote technology uh, be being accessible to the railroad industry? Well, that's, that's a good question. I need, it could have a lengthy answer, but one of the things to do is how each person or each researcher would like to apply it, right? We have, for example, for rails themselves, if we want to do it in situ and test those, we have a number of established technologies already, like eddy current sensors and so on, Laser vibrometry can do also that with probably higher resolution, which means that you can detect smaller cracks, smaller defects, and you put that on a rail, on a rail car, and you test in situ. You go and measure it on in the field, right? That would be one. For stresses and strains, we have devices that will measure stresses and strains. Those will be in the lab for measuring the structure of a rail car. For example, like we said that China and Japan and other countries are doing it. If we want better comfort, better structural and integrity, then we shake the car and we measure with a 3D laser vibrometer and we measure the deflection shapes, how it deflects. And if those deflections are relevant, then we go on fix or improve improve the, the model. If there are no significant, we leave them alone. If we want better acoustics, we also can um, do tests for, let's say, transmission of acoustics and so on. So each researcher will identify what is the field of interest that they have. And then we will discuss it together with um, how to implement it. The implementation could be rather quick in some aspects. In some aspects could be a little bit more lengthy because well, we thank have- you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mario. Any comments from the other panelists on the laser Doppler uh, technology? I, I would just like to say that when it comes to, when it comes to where there's, there's a big push in the rail industry for uh, measurement, real-time measurement of trains and mobile, those sorts of things. And any of the any of the standoff technologies where you can gain useful measurements is is a big plus in the industry at this point. I agree with that, Stephen. Um, since you're talking, let's stay with you, Stephen. In Massachusetts alone, we have over 800 rail bridges, um, some serving the passage of both freight and passenger in a cross jurisdictional. Um, away. When determining uh, cyclic behavior of steel bridges, load bearing capacity and stress range variations, um, as you mentioned, the dimensions of each of each um, uh, train set and the conditions are unique to each bridge, right? So in your experience, what challenges do you face when determining um, the behavior stressors and factors in aligning fatigue with structures that serve multi-carriers 
And how do you bridge, pun intended, <laughs> the gap to address <laughs> forensics review and to drive solutions to these problems? I think that's the question of the century, but um, at a high level, Stephen. At a high level, I mean, <laughs> when you when you talk about when you talk about passenger passenger trains and freight trains on the same track, passenger trains are a lot like automobiles. We don't really count them. They're not heavy enough to really make much difference. You may get one cycle out of a locomotive, but maybe not. If you've got two locomotives, you will get a cycle. But if you've only got one locomotive, you won't. You may not even get a cycle out of that. So. You have to look at the kinds of traffic, intermodal traffic, uh, uh, contain, shipment of containers and trailers. Um, in, in longer span lengths, they really and truly don't generate much in the way of fatigue damage. You know, it's, it's basic. That's why I talked about in my presentation, classifying the type of trains you have and the type of equipment you're running. You have to keep up with the logistics of the equipment that's being used. Okay, and I have another question that came in from the audience that ties into that one nicely. Is there some test data or procedure to determine on moving train axle loads over a bridge? Um, there's been some work done initially by TTCI. Uh, what the railroads have these days in terms of detectors, uh, they have what is known as a wheel impact load detector. And these were originally developed to uh, to uh, get rid of wheels that had large flat spots and, and wheels that got out of round and their dynamic forces ended up becoming too great. Well, one of the side benefits of this is you can actually, it, it's a series of eight scales that measures the wheel and they measure the differential in weights as it goes, goes, through, the, goes through the different eight scales. Well, you can take the average of that and you can actually know what, what, the, what our axle loads are as we, as we uh, as we are pulling trains out of out of the territories, so for any one specific bridge, we may not know what what its, what its actual load is. Uh, but if we know, based on being able to do some of those readings, we can classify traffic as to as to uh, what kind of weights we have on, on trains. So that's that's possible. There's been some work work done in that. Uh, big data is a, is a is a term in the railroad industry right now. And they, there are, there are, there's, that's kind of an open field in doing analysis of big data because they have tons of it. Okay, thank you for that. And one more for you from the audience. Uh, was the last photo, the Lobato trestle on the Cumbers and Toltec? I don't know that for sure, but having been at the site many, many years ago, I do believe that is Lobato Creek, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> This um, next question goes to Karina and Chris. Are there systems in rail cars to collect data to support crash analysis, sort of like the black box? Sure, I'm happy to speak to that. That's a great question. For those of you who don't know, there is an equivalent to a black box um, called an event recorder. Um, and, and from that, we have, we, when we investigate accidents, that's one of the pieces of information that can be really uh, informative and helpful. Uh, in, in at least a couple accidents that I can think of, one being Chatsworth, California, uh, one of the biggest ones we've had in, the, in terms of number of fatalities in the, in the last couple of decades, um, we were able to use the, the event recorder data to look at the, the deceleration of the, the, the impact of two train to train, uh, it was a train to train collision, um, and we were able to look at the decelerations of the trains and then use that and create a computer uh, simulation um, and, and validate the model to show that it was representing the, the approximate accident. Um, and then from that, we were able to look at the secondary impact velocities, which are the decelerations that the passengers experienced as they were impacting uh, the tables and, and their other surroundings. Um, so this has been really, uh, yeah, a, a useful thing that, that does exist in, in, in uh, trains, and um, we definitely make use of it. Thank you, Karina. Um, to follow up on a question uh, for Chris, um, in terms of occupant protection enhancements and your uh, work on glazing retention, um, where do you see this? 
next? What is it that, um, um, what additional resources or opportunities or um, what do you need to move this to the next stage? And uh, are, are we looking at public private partnerships or a little bit more than that to, to kind of complete this cycle of research and, and take it to the next step in potentially uh, policy driving um, um, changes? Yeah, um, a few things. Um, Sharma and Associates has done a great job looking into this problem and getting started on it. Um, but the, the results of their research indicate that it, more than just a, a retrofit, I think, is going to be needed to really solve the problem of winter retention and rollover. Um, we need, uh, I don't want to prescribe the solutions yet, but some kind of a mechanical positive fastener to retain windows so that the gaskets can't be pulled out in accidents. Um, it's tricky because there are regulations that say you need to be able to remove the windows from the inside and outside the emergency windows without tools. Um, and so there are certainly constraints on the design issue. Um, but I think public part private partnerships would be great. Um, Sean Woody this morning talked about the BAA um, broad agency agreement uh, system that the FRA has. Um, I think that would be a wonderful way for people to get involved, um, putting proposals together with ideas for improving the glazing design. Um, and then we need to also work with the industry. What, um, what I personally would like to see, you know, the, the regulations, there are many regulations about for glazing, um, dealing with uh, ballistic impacts, blunt objects, um, uh, pressure on the windows in tunnels, um, visibility, um, but as I had said, glazing retention is not addressed. So I think a solution could be to come up with an, an APTA standard specifically focused on glazing retention that when it evolves and gets published and um, eventually it could be incorporated by reference into the regulations to, to address the retention without um, necessarily coming up with um, just a new regulation. So, and then with our um, APTA construction sector working group, we could um, look at what this standard would look like, which as I mentioned a little bit, it would encompass um, testing and test performance requirements for these tests. And I, I foresee us coming to agreement within the working group as to what those requirements should be, what the test should be, and um, and then once it comes to fruition, incorporating that published standard into the into the code of reg federal regulations. So it's not a it's not a fast process, unfortunately. Right. Um, but that's that's how I see the process playing out. Right. Thank you, Chris. And uh, Stephen, one more question for you. Um, in your opinion, the Cooper Elode um, standards applied today. Are these still relevant? Is it comparable to other standards for determining cyclic behaviors and fatigue used by other countries? What, what, what is your opinion on, on this matter? For, for maximum moment, maximum conditions, the Cooper, the Cooper E-load system is still very much a relevant system. It gives you, it gives you through all ranges of span lengths, it gives you a very high, very high design value, which is what you need. And so the spacings of the axles themselves are too close together for a fatigue model, but they're great for a they're great for a uh, a live load model for any for any span length. Uh, the Europeans take a different approach in Eurocode. Eurocode has a whole series of trains based on what trains are going to be using, um, what trains are going to be using the bridge that it's on, um, and so they go through and do do a, just a you know a complete process like that. We're trying to simplify it for, for, for North America because we want to be able to just, if we can do it into two or three train groups, groups of trains, that would be nice uh, versus, versus uh, Europe, which has, you know, I mean, there's like 10 or 11 different load trains you have to use. And so it can get to be a bit cumbersome. So uh, in essence, the actual, the actual load model that, that Europe uses is, is not all that unfamiliar to anybody who's seen Cooper. The actual maximum load model, but their the trends they use for fatigue are are, are much more realistic in appearance. 
Okay, thank you for, for your comment and your opinion. Um, we have uh, one more question. Has there been a go-to resource for determining train travel history on various lines throughout the US? And this is our last question and then we'll close it with that one. I believe that may be for you, Stephen. Yes, um, that data is actually private. Uh, okay. And it's published, it's the railroads, the railroads maintain that information privately. Uh, there, there were a series of reports back in the day they were called Copeland Traffic Density Reports, and Mr. Copeland headed headed a big investment fund, and he would he he was able to obtain the data through his investments with the railroads and actually published a bunch of these in books. But in general, it is private information. Uh, the only ones who will probably can give you any information on ton, tonnages would be would be the DOTs who actually own railroads and and have traffic all along. Uh, all it becomes right, public you. information for them. And thank you so much. Um, I believe that the, that is the last question. I would like to thank all of the panelists for um, taking the time to do these presentations for us and to bring uh, to our attention in the audience the different um, elements of your research and um, Mario for the uh, technology review and the innovation of the laser uh, Doppler vibrometry. Um, thank you all for attending this session. Mushul, would you like to do the closing argument um, or the closing? Okay. So again, not much to, to add. So thank you for a great discussion. I enjoyed a lot. I learned the new things. I'm structural engineer, but now glazing is an important issue. So I, I, I like that. So we'll be taking a 50 minute break. Uh, I will see you at 2.45 when we return with the final session for the day on solutions and opportunities. Thank you for all. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks everyone.